Hey guys, what's up? It's Tess. Welcome back to my channel. So I wanted to make a video about my acne because I feel like it is something a lot of us struggle with. And the reason I thought it was important to make this video was because when I made my transition from kind of the corporate world to esthetician school, I was just starting out picture little Tess, I mean, not little, this was a couple of years ago, but little me sitting in class, I had a face full of jawline and cheek and forehead acne. And it was something that came about a little bit later in life for me. I'd always had like really nice, easy skin. And then here I was trying to pursue the one thing I was so excited about in life and that I had given up so much for, but I was dealing with this condition I hadn't learned how to manage. And I was just sitting there in so much self-doubt wondering how people would ever trust me with their skin when I couldn't get my own to a healthy place. So I thought it was important if any of you out there are wanting to become estheticians and struggling with your own skin insecurities or self-doubts, I wanted to make this video to tell you there's so many ways skin conditions can be managed. And more than that, I think going through any kind of skin related insecurity, even if it's something you are currently dealing with, like myself, I still struggle with acne. It's cyclical. It's not something that you cure in a month or two and, you know, you never have to deal with again. It it comes back. So I just wanted to make this video to tell you guys, if you're going through any kind of skin insecurity it can only make you a more skilled and empathetic esthetician. So in this video, I wanted to get into a few ways I learned to manage my acne because I know it is a condition that can really affect people's self-confidence. I didn't want to look anyone in the eye. Just whenever I met somebody in school, when you're interfacing with so many new people, constantly you're meeting clients, you're meeting new friends, that's like the last time you want to feel insecure. And here I was going through this whole insecurity. So I'm going to kind of dive into some of the mistakes I was making and just try to shed some light on acne and things you can do to help the condition because I think there are a lot of little things that can kind of add up and contribute to the condition. So we will just dive into it. If you guys haven't subscribed yet, it would mean so much. I'm an esthetician and I make a lot of skin related as well as other wellness style videos. So if you guys like that stuff, if you like me, please make sure to subscribe and it would mean so much if you liked and commented on this video but we'll just go ahead and get into it. Okay, so when I transitioned into becoming an esthetician, I had left the beauty, entertainment, and PR world. So I was constantly surrounded by beauty products of all kinds on my desk, up for grabs, new things people were talking about all the time and I was so excited by that stuff. I have always been super interested in beauty and magazines especially is kind of where it all started for me. I talked about this on my podcast, my obsession with magazines at a really young age, just flipping through the pages, being so interested in product. And I think the kind of the dark side that comes with that is the whole advertising and marketing behind certain products and cosmeceuticals that the mainstream consumer doesn't have the ingredient knowledge to separate what's on a product's label versus what's when you turn the bottle over, what's on the other side, and what do these ingredients mean? So moral of the story is I was such a, you know, beauty guru or beauty junkie, a lot of people like to say, and I think that's where you can run into problems because you are likely trying so many products, you're mixing a lot of ingredients. There are a lot of cosmeceuticals that have a lot of different oil blends, which is where I started to run into problems. So tip number one, you have to get savvy about 
the cosmeceuticals you are buying. And my best advice if you are looking for a change in your skin is to invest in professional grade products. This doesn't mean they have to be super expensive products, but they're just different from the mainstream consumer cosmeceuticals in that they are formulated to have certain percentages of actives. They are medical grade ingredients. They are FDA approved and safe for the skin, and they are determined to have an effect on the skin. So you are paying for the results and the research behind these products as opposed to marketing and advertising and you know, so the social media campaigns a beauty brand might be paying for. So I'd really strongly suggest as an esthetician, investing in professional products. As an esthetician, the only products I really recommend are professional grade products. And when people tend to ask, what do you think about this new brand? What do you think about this? What's the best drugstore line you can buy? My answer is always, well, I only recommend professional grade products as a professional. So I really think the quality of your products is super important. And that is the first thing I had to really get serious about. And I'm somebody who loves going into Sephora. I love seeing what's new and trending in beauty, but I think especially trendy beauty products and skincare is where you might run into problems with your skin. The next thing I want to highlight is the importance of a really good cleanser. So your cleanser should really just leave the skin feeling soft and supple and clean. It shouldn't leave the skin feeling stripped or dry or tight. When it is stripped and dry, that barrier is compromised, leaving it prone to all types of infection and external elements, irritation, aggravation, all that kind of stuff. So. This is the first professional cleanser I purchased outside of SD school where we used Dermalogica, which I think is okay. But this is the Chamomile Cleanser by Derma Plus. And I'll link these products below, the ones that you are able to buy in case anybody wants to buy them. Don't mean to sound like I'm advertising anything, but this is where I work. This is a product I recommend to all my clients. It's just a very calming, soothing, mild cleanser because I think... The cleanse is so important in your routine, and if you don't have a thorough cleanse, and if you are using something that's too harsh or not quite right for your skin, you might start developing little problems and trying to fix it with toners and serums and all these things that a lot of times it just comes down to having the right foundation and using the right core product. So. At the end of the day, I recommend a, a mild, soothing, professional-grade cleanser. I think that's about 70% of your routine, and you want to make sure you are doing a very thorough cleanse, so I always recommend at least 60 seconds to really thoroughly massage in your cleanser, get under the fine facial hair we all have, really work on the T-zone or those areas where we produce a little bit more oil. And the next thing I will get into for this reason is a good cleansing tool. I love this one. It is the Foreo. I like it because it stays free of bacteria because of the silicone. So I think it's more user-friendly as opposed to the Clarisonic, I think those are okay, but I don't know how many people are actually disinfecting them. So I think this is a little bit of a better option. It's very gentle. It's not true exfoliation. It's just going to offer really thorough cleansing and get, um, you know, underneath all that fine facial hair, help to drain lymph and toxins. And just, I think the timed element really makes sure people are cleansing their skin properly. So what I really just want to emphasize is a thorough cleanse with something that is quite gentle and that you will use on a regular basis and enjoy using. I think we all get to the point where we are just tired at the end of the day and the last thing we wanna do is spend the time cleansing our skin, but it's really, imp really important, especially for acne prone skin types, especially at the end of the day to remove all of that. So I just really wanna emphasize a good cleanse. The last thing I'll say on that note is to make sure your cleanser is free of sodium lauryl sulfate, which can be really stripping on the skin. It's that agent in cleansers that makes it 
really nice and foamy, but it's gonna be just too harsh for the skin and again, compromise that barrier. So I would look for a cleanser that is made without fragrance as well as SLS. SLS can also be in toothpaste. It can be in your laundry detergent, your shampoo conditioner. It's a really common cheap ingredient. So I would be on the lookout for that if you are dealing with acne and wondering what the cause may be. Okay, since we just talked about cleanser, I wanted to touch on moisturizer. I think there's kind of two common myths, one being that oily skin types shouldn't use moisturizer, the second being that oily skin types should use a lot of oil to kind of counterbalance it. I think both are false. Oily skin does need moisturizer. The key difference is oily skin needs water as opposed to oil. The skin already has enough oil and nourishment, but it needs that water to stay hydrated and keep everything intact. So what I'd recommend for an oily skin type is looking for an oil-free moisturizer that still has water binding ingredients, that still has a lot of anti-inflammatories, but is not gonna be overly nourishing. So this was kind of key for me in my acne journey, realizing that oil-free moisturizer was enough for my skin. And especially if I'm layering serums, moisturizer, and sunscreen, especially in the warmer months, using a moisturizer with oil in it was just overkill. And it was kind of creating this occlusive effect where it was causing a lot of blockage, oxygen couldn't get into the skin, and that was kind of the perfect environment for bacteria and acne. So just think about layering, be mindful of what might be a little bit too much for your skin, and maybe make adjustments by adding in an oil-free moisturizer. Alrighty, so I want to get into active ingredients because I think these are some of the key players that will start dislodging that congestion. The distinction I wanna make is it's really important to have that good foundation of your cleanse and your moisturizer before you start integrating actives because the skin will probably not receive them well if things are compromised, if the skin is not in a healthy, balanced place where it's stripped by a cleanser, for example, or just used to really cheap aggravating ingredients, it won't be happy if you're introducing things that are going to cause stimulation. So once I got that foundation down, I started to integrate a few different products. So the ingredients I started using, and I'm not saying to integrate all of these at once, you have to be somewhat careful when you are introducing actives and you know stimulating professional products into the routine, but slowly over time, these really made a difference in my skin. So these are kind of my core products. The first is the purifying toner from Dermaplus. This has a little bit of salicylic. So salicylic is great for dissolving the blackhead congestion before it gets to be that those deeper whiteheads. So this was very crucial. Love a little bit of salicylic. The next one I have is a little bit of a benzoyl peroxide lotion. I have to be careful when using this because it's very active and benzoyl can be triggering for some people, but I've found used on a, a couple day a week basis. This has been really helpful. Benzoyl peroxide does a really good job of bringing oxygen to the pores. And this is a leave-on product, so it stays on long enough to really get in there and kill that bacteria. And the last one I want to talk about is my good old Retin-A. This is something you would get prescribed from a doctor or a nurse, and I have a 0.025 percentage. Retin-A is kind of the gold standard in terms of acne. It's recommended by all dermatologists. Estheticians recommend it based on different percentages. 
not all estheticians are believers in the prescription retinol. It can be a little bit controversial, but the difference in a prescription version of retinol versus something you'd get at the drugstore or over the counter is how quickly it has an effect on the skin. So for me, this was a super effective ingredient for my skin in terms of increasing that cell turnover and really keeping the pores clean. Vitamin A is an incredible ingredient if you can use it. For me, the key was finding the right percentage. When I first started SD school, I went to a derm and I was prescribed a very high dose of Retin-A. My skin was peeling off. It was horrible. So my conception was that I wasn't able to use Retin-A I know now it was just too high of a percentage. So it can be a little bit of a uh, tricky road with Retin-A figuring out what percentage is right for you. And there can be a little bit of an adjustment period where you might break out a little bit more, you might feel dry. So this one can be a little bit tricky and it's not for everyone. It has to be prescribed for you, but if you can use it, it can be very effective. The next thing I had to be very mindful of was bringing all of this, bringing my skincare to the gym. I think a lot of us get in the habit where we're just, we go to the gym, we want to rush home and eat, feed the dog, whatever we're going to do. But I really advise bringing all of your stuff to the gym because that bacteria can work really fast. It's important to cleanse the skin as soon as you're done with your workout. So that was something that was really important especially as I was stimulating all of those oil glands. Really important for my gym rats to bring your skincare to the gym and get into your cleansing as soon as you can after a workout. You might wanna use a little bit of salicylic or benzoyl peroxide post-workout to help kill that bacteria. Okay, I also want to talk about something kind of random, but it is dryer sheets and laundry detergent. There's a certain type of breakout I see with a lot of my clients where it's kind of this rash, rashy breakout on their chest. They're red, they're really tiny papules on their check, chest, sometimes on their face. And people tell me a lot of times, I've used Tide or I've used Gain since I was little. I've never had a problem. The thing is that the inflammation can develop slowly over time and your skin can just get to a point where it no longer tolerates it. It's at a very high level of inflammation and it's trying to tell you something. So I would recommend switching to a free and clear version of your detergent and altogether taking out dryer sheets. They have a lie in their kind of coating that can stay on the skin and it's kind of like a filmy, greasy residue. So instead of dryer sheets, I would recommend something like those wool balls or maybe try not even using them and maybe that works for you. I also quickly want to highlight minimizing oils in your routine if you are breaking out. The oil trend is just getting crazy. It's in so many products, like I said, from the cleansing balms to makeup removers. And I know a lot of people tend to use things like coconut oil to remove their eye makeup. It, the oils just tend to not rinse clean and they will leave that film and greasy residue on the skin. So it creates a lot of congestion over time. It might even create little milia that are deeper within the skin and very hard to get out. So I would minimize oil in your routine and just use it maybe as a treatment a couple times a week if you're feeling dry. You can do some facial massage with it. Not too much if you're super acneic because so you don't want to overstimulate the skin, but a little bit of a light oil like a jojoba or a squalene might have its place in the routine if you are feeling a little bit dry. Let's talk about makeup because the makeup market has exploded. What with, you know, YouTube and all these new products, people want to try everything new that comes on the market. 
I have made the switch over to mineral makeup because it is non-comedogenic and it has a healing effect on the skin. I think there just tends to be a lot of silicones, oils, fragrance, different things added to makeup products. People aren't quite aware of how they can affect the skin. So these are some of the products I use by Jane Iredale and Bare Minerals. So I really recommend trying out mineral makeup instead if you are looking for something that's going to be less pore clogging. The last thing I'll say about makeup is avoiding makeup sponges, which can harbor a lot of bacteria. I tend to use just little brushes. I wash them after one or two uses and I will keep them in a container where they are, you know, safe from any airborne bacteria, dust, all of that stuff. So I keep them really clean and I would avoid any type of sponges. Ideally, like clean hands are an option. Disposable sponges, although they're not super sustainable, or brushes that you can clean frequently would be a better option. Okay, the next thing I want to speak on is diet. This is one of the hardest things for people to get under control. I know a lot of my clients especially struggle with dairy. A lot of people love cheese, but if you are struggling with breakouts, I would suggest maybe trying to wean off the dairy and the cheese, especially since there's a, there tends to be a lot of added hormones in cheeses. But I would just try taking two weeks off of the dairy, see if it makes a difference. For me, it really did. I couldn't imagine a world where I wasn't eating cheese before, but I haven't had it in years. If I do, I'll kind of go for like a goat or a sheep cheese and I will have it in moderation, but that's been really key. Another important thing for me has been weaning off sugar, even natural sugar like fruits. I was really into smoothies when I was struggling with my autoimmune disease. So I was making really high sugar smoothies with a lot of tropical fruits that have the highest sugar. So mango, pineapple, all those things. And again, I'm not a dietitian, I'm an esthetician. So these are just recommendations for you to check with your doctor if you want to look into food related acne and how it can contribute to acne. So dairy, sugar, Alcohol was something else I cut out of my diet completely, not doable for everyone, but just a suggestion, especially things like wine that have both the sugar and the alcohol and other additives that can be a big contributor. The last thing I'll mention is gluten. So that was something I took out of my dairy, my diet because it was causing inflammation in my body. So all those things together really helped to kind of balance my sugar levels and lower inflammation, which is really the name of the game. The last thing I want to highlight is the importance of regular facials and extractions if you are dealing with acne. Having the right home care is very important, but you may need to get the help of a professional to extract some of the infection. That is what has helped me so much. Now I'm to a point where I am makeup free and able to film, which I really didn't think I would be able to do. But seeing a really good acne specialist has helped me minimize the infection over time. So getting those extractions is really important for the skin so the infection doesn't continue to spread. Likely you will see acne kind of reoccur in some of the similar spots. So until you minimize that infection, they might keep coming back. It's also important in those facials to have, you know, chemical peels that are going to help dissolve that congestion and to get advised on the right home care routine so you are using the right products to break up the cycle of acne at home in between your appointments. All right guys, that is it for this video. I really hope some of these tips may have helped you because I know the struggle is so real with acne. If you have any questions, please let me know in the comments below and I will see you guys in the next video.